Okay, the first specific synovial joint we're going to look at is the shoulder joint. Um, these pictures are fair game uh, for any quiz or, or test question. So we want to you know, pay particular attention to the anatomy that's identified on this picture. We also want to kind of go through a process when we learn a new joint. Um, the first thing we want to do is remind ourselves of the bones and then the specific part of those bones that form the joint. So the shoulder joint is a ball and socket joint. Uh, the ball is the head of the humerus, and then the socket is the glenoid cavity or glenoid fossa of the scapula. So here we see the head of the humerus, that proximal end, and then here is that shallow glenoid cavity. And that shallow glenoid cavity is going to allow a lot of motion. If we had a really deep socket, that would restrict the amount of movement. So the shoulder joint has the largest range of motion. Uh, so we want to make sure in order to allow that range of motion, we don't have a very deep socket. So that's why the glenoid is more like a fossa uh, than, a, than a deep socket. So those are the bones that come together. Uh, it's also called the glenohumeral joint because it's the glenoid and the humerus. Uh, it is diarthrotic, all right, so it's freely movable. The structure is synovial, all right, ball and socket. And then the motion is multiaxial, all right. So th this, this joint has the greatest range of motion of all of our synovial joints. What is the kind of comparison? with this and the other ball and socket, which is your hip. Uh, well, your shoulder has much more mobility than a hip. You can do more. It's got a larger range of motion. But because of that, it loses stability. All right, so this is a good kind of comparison to make. When you have a joint that's very mobile, it tends to have lower stability. All right, so there are things, there are structures that help to stabilize your shoulder. Uh, an example is your rotator cuff. Uh, muscles. Uh, what specific motion is a, allowed at a shoulder joint? It flexes and extends. It can abduct and adduct. And then it can rotate. It can rotate away. We call that lateral rotation. And then it can rotate inward. And that's known as medial rotation. So these are the six motions that all ball and sockets can allow. Um, so we're also going to revisit these six things when we get to the hip joint. Now, we're going to then add to this. So the next chapters we do is our muscles. So we're going to learn what muscles cause all these actions. So it's very important for you to understand these motions now because when we get to muscles and we're talking about what muscles might extend or, or abduct or, or laterally rotate your humerus, you know exactly what those motions mean. Uh, it has what's known as a glenoid labrum. So a labrum, that word labrum means lip. Um, these are fibrocartilage lips that surround the edges of the sockets. So it's found in the glenoid. It's also found in your hip. It's found in the acetabulum. All right. So your ball and socket joints have little lips. And what that does is it just makes that socket a little deeper and it helps hold that and position that head in the glenoid a little better. All right, so right here and right over here is the glenoid labrum. Uh, you've got some stabilizers uh, of this joint. Again, if you have low stability, uh, you're going to want to have other things in there to help stabilize this joint. Uh, those include the long head tendon of the biceps. Uh, so that's this tendon here. Because it crosses from above that glenoid, it can help stabilize that, that joint. All right, so that tendon helps stabilize. And then your rotator cuff muscles. So these are the four muscles that belong to a group of muscles known as the rotator cuff. Um, it forms kind of a sleeve around the joint and helps hold that humerus in the socket. So they're muscles, they allow some motion of the humerus, uh, but they have this additional function in stabilizing the shoulder joint.
And when we move on to muscles, we're going to learn their names. Uh, supraspinatus, uh, infraspinatus, subscapularis, and teres minor. So those are your four rotator cuffs. All right, so let's look at anything else we, we need to identify. Some of this stuff we know, right? There's the acromion of the scapula. There's the glenoid. There's the head of the humerus. Um, again, this is a tendon. It has a tendon sheath surrounding it, protecting that tendon. There is a bursa. So notice this bursa here is called the subacromial bursa. It's named that because it's just beneath the acromion. Uh, so there's a little cushion here that helps cushion. It doesn't show this, but there's a muscle that runs right through here, uh, this supraspinatus muscle. So this, this helps cushion anything in between the acromion and the, and the humerus. All right, we see the, the capsule here, and then inside this, this capsule is the cavity, which is going to have synovial fluid. We see each bone has articular cartilage. Here's the articular cartilage of the head of the humerus, and then here's the articular cartilage of the glenoid. All right, so that's your, your shoulder joint. The next joint we're going to talk about is, is the elbow. Uh, there's actually two joints here. So we want to make sure we kind of understand that there's a hinge joint that allows flexion and extension. There's also a pivot joint that allows that rotation so you can pronate and supinate. So let's look at the hinge first. The hinge is formed between the trochlear notch of the ulna and the trochlea of the humerus. So here's the trochlear notch of the ulna. Here is the trochlea of the humerus. All right. Remember that ulna is going to have the olecranon, so this little point here is the olecranon. So this is a diarthrotic. It is synovial hinge, uniaxial, that allows flexion and extension. Uh, there are some important ligaments. Um, a couple of the more important ligaments that help prevent... Um, kind of a side-to-side -side movement of the elbow. You don't want your elbow to abduct or adduct. Um, those are the collateral ligaments. Uh, you have what's known as the ulnar collateral ligament because it's on the ulna side. And then there's a radial collateral ligament because it's on the radius side. Uh, this is a lateral view of the elbow, so the radius is kind of closer to you. Uh, so this is the radial collateral ligament. But if we were to look on the other side of the elbow joint, the ulna side, there would be an ulnar collateral ligament. And sometimes the ulnar collateral ligament will tear, uh, particularly with baseball players and pitching. Uh, the motion that pitchers do when they pitch a baseball, um, it can cause tearing of that ulnar collateral. And the surgical procedure that is done is known as a Tommy John surgery. So that kind of repairs that torn ulnar collateral ligament. So that's the hinge joint. There's also the proximal radio ulnar joint. So remember, if that's a, that's a pivot joint. And a pivot joint is going to have a ring. And what forms the ring is a ligament known as the annular ligament. So this ring wraps around the radius, and then the radius can rotate inside of that annular ligament. All right? So that joint allows the pronation and supination. Notice there's a bursa here. Uh, this is called the olecranon bursa. So that bursa protects the skin that lies over top of your elbow. Um, you, if, you, if you bump your elbow into something, you want to be able to kind of protect the skin from that olecranon. Uh, so there's a little thin cushion in between the skin covering your elbow and the olecranon called the olecranon bursa. All right, so that was two joints, the, the hinge joint in the elbow and then the pivot joint. Uh, and again, remember that annular ligament forms the ring for the pivot. Next joint is the hip. Uh, it's our other ball and socket joint. So it's going to have a lot of, this, a lot of similar features as your shoulder uh, in that it is... It, the, the head of the femur forms the ball, and then the acetabulum of your hip 
forms the socket. Now notice already we see that the socket is much deeper than the glenoid. So what that deep socket does is it restricts a little bit of the movement. Um, so this, this joint is, um, has a lower range of movement compared to the shoulder, um, but it is more stable than the shoulder. So it is diarthrotic, ball and socket, multi-axial, less mobility compared to the shoulder, but more stability because of that deeper uh, acetabulum. It allows all the same motions as your shoulder, flexion and extension, abduction, adduction, and then you can rotate your leg in, medial rotation, and you can rotate your leg away, lateral rotation. There's a labrum, the acetabular labrum, so you can see a little bit of it here, and then again over here, so that's that fibrocartilaginous lip around the edge of the socket. And then there's an additional ligament inside the capsule. So this would be an example of an intracapsular ligament known as the ligamentum teres. Uh, that word teres is used a few times in anatomy. It means cylindrical. This is a very cylindrical ligament. And what it does is it attaches to the head and just helps hold that head uh, inside that acetabulum. There's also an artery that runs with it. All right, so there's an artery that goes into that head and nourishes that head. Uh, interesting story is that if you dislocate your hip, um, it can tear that ligamentum teres and rupture that artery. Uh, so if that's not repaired quickly, uh, the head of the, the femur could die because of the loss of blood flow, and you might need a complete hip replacement. Uh, the good news is it's very difficult to uh, dislocate a hip, um, but when it does, they have to really look closely at that ligamentum teres in the blood vessel and make sure that um, they can re-nourish uh, that, that femur. So that's your hip joint. Last one, well not last, we're going to do TMJ, but probably the most important joint in your body is your knee joint. Uh, the reason being is it's uh, the most injured uh, joint in the body when it comes to, say, athletics. Um, it, there's a lot of weight uh, going through your knees. Uh, over time, you can get a lot of damage later in life uh, in the knees. And then again, during sporting activities, uh, we see a lot of injuries to the knee. Uh, the knee is probably the more complicated joint in the body. Uh, it is a hinge. Uh, it's a hinge formed between the condyles of the femur, so that's the distal end of the femur, there are two condyles. There's the medial and lateral condyles, and then they go with the condyles of the tibia. So the tibia has medial and lateral condyles. So it's the largest, most complex joint. Complexity comes from the fact that there's some of these other structures. There's menisci, so there's a lateral and medial meniscus. There's a lot of bursae in there. Uh, so there's a lot of cushions. There's intracapsular ligaments like the ACL and PCL. Uh, there's collateral ligaments. You've got this patella in there as well, and it forms a joint uh, with the femur. So it's, it's a very complicated joint. It's diarthrotic. It's synovial. It's a hinge. It's uniaxial, and it allows flexion and extension. There's a slight degree of rotation, but not very much. There's menisci. So I'll remind you that menisci is fibrocartilage. All right? It helps to do a number of things. One, it absorbs some shock. Right? It absorbs a lot of the, the, the weight that goes from femur into tibia. It also helps distribute the weight. So if you didn't have these menisci, all the weight from this femur would go right into this little part of the tibia, and that's too much weight. Uh, so to distribute the weight evenly, these menisci kind of help those two bones uh, fit better together and spreads that force out. All right, so very important. And that's why even a minor tear in a meniscus, if it's not repaired, can lead to 
bigger problems, uh, if not um, addressed, because it can redistribute some of that weight and cause more damage to, uh, in particular, it causes damage to the articular cartilage. So there's a lateral medial meniscus. Uh, there's another joint here. There's the femoropatellar joint, which is the joint between the patella and the femur. Notice the patella does not make contact with the tibia. It makes contact with the femur. There's a quadriceps femoris tendon. So your quadricep muscles are right up here. Uh, those are your large anterior thigh muscles. And they all share this tendon. Uh, then kind of encapsulates the patella. Remember the patella being a sesamoid bone. Then it becomes a ligament. So it's the same tissue. It's just here, it's a tendon, right? Because it's muscle to bone. But then down here, it's more bone to bone. It's patella to tibia. Uh, sometimes it's called the patellar tendon. Uh, I like to call it patellar ligament, but I'm a little bit nitpicky. Uh, and then there's a whole bunch of fluid-filled uh, bursae in here. So there's one called the suprapatellar bursa because it's above the patella. Here's a pre-patellar bursa because it's in front of the patella. Here's an infra-patellar bursa because it's below the patella. There's also a lot of fat. So notice there's also fat that helps kind of cushion in and around the knee joint. Uh, ligaments. So ligaments is a, is a very important thing to address here with the knee. Uh, we're going to separate the ligaments into the collateral ligaments and the cruciate ligaments. So this is another drawing of a knee joint. It's flexed, all right? So this knee joint is bent at about a 90 degree angle. So we see the condyles of the femur. Here's the condyles of the tibia. There's your fibula. Notice none of the weight goes from femur into fibula. So femur and fibula do not make contact. All the weight goes into the tibia. So that tibia is weight bearing the fibula is more for stabi stability. We see the two menisci. Here's the medial meniscus. Here's the lateral meniscus. And then we have the collaterals. So on the fibular side, or the lateral side, there's the fibular collateral ligament. And that's named because it goes from fibula to femur. On the inside, or the medial side, you have the medial collateral ligament because it goes from uh, tibia here to femur here. All right, so those are collaterals. Collateral ligaments are extracapsular on each side of a hinge, and they're going to prevent that tibia from moving this way or this way. So you don't want that tibia to abduct. You don't want that tibia to adduct. The cruciate ligaments are intracapsular. They're inside the capsule. And cruciate means cross, like a crucifix. All right, so these ligaments crisscross. There's one in the front, and there's one in the back. So you got an anterior cruciate and a posterior cruciate. Um, so just as a review, you have the extracapsular ligaments on the outside, uh, the fibular collateral, also known as the lateral collateral right, because the fibula is lateral. The tibial collateral is also known as the medial collateral, all right. So it depends on who you talk to and who's, you know, naming the, these ligaments. Um, if you're the fibular collateral ligament, you could also be called lateral collateral. And then if you're the tibial collateral, you might be called the medial collateral. And you probably hear medial collateral much more often, the MCL, all right. Um, because it tears um, quite often in, in sporting injuries. The intracapsular ligaments are the cruciate ligaments, the ACL and PCL. Uh, the ACL prevents forward sliding of the tibia, and it prevents hyperextension of the knee. Whereas the posterior cruciate prevents backward sliding of the tibia, or forward sliding of the femur, which kind of result would result in the same type of movement. All right, so those are those four really important ligaments of the knee. Uh, this is just the posterior view.
Again, looking at the back, we can see better the posterior cruciate ligament, but you can still see the collaterals on each side, and you can see a little bit of the anterior cruciate ligament. Um, this is just another drawing, kind of. The reason why I like to show this one is it better shows the menisci. Uh, you could still, you know, identify the cruciates and the collaterals, uh, but this also shows uh, on the inside here the lateral meniscus, which sits between the lateral condyles of the femur and tibia, and then the medial meniscus, which lies in between the medial condyles. And notice how it's going to help distribute that weight evenly. This is another view I like to show, again, kind of showing the, the menisci. Um, this would be a superior view, kind of looking down at the top of the tibia. Um, and the two femoral condyles would lie right in those two menisci. You can also see the cruciate ligaments and how they're going to be crossing one another. Uh, on the inside of that capsule. Finally, this is a, one of the more common injuries that occur. Uh, when you get hit with force on the, the lateral side of the knee, right? Here's the fibula, so we know this is the outer part of the knee. When you get hit, say in football or soccer or, or, or some type of uh, contact sport, what happens is you'll tear that medial meniscus right, because of that movement, you can tear the anterior cruciate ligament, and quite often you're going to tear that medial meniscus. So a lot of times these blows to the knee from the outside cause damage to all three of those uh, structures. All right, finally, a little bit on the TMJ, temporal mandibular joint. It's kind of a combo joint. It's both a hinge, so you can uh, move your mandible up and down, but it's also a gliding joint, so you can move it side to side, forward and backwards. Um, it forms between the mandibular fossa of the temporal bone, right? That's that depression in the temporal bone. And then the mandibular condyle sits in that mandibular fossa. Uh, it's the only freely movable joint in the skull, right? Most of the joints in the skull are sutures. It's a combination, hinge, and gliding. There is a meniscus, or often called an articular disc. All right, so this pointed out as an articular disc is also a type of meniscus. It just helps the two bones fit better together. And then this one is known as being the most easily dislocated. A lot of people think it's the shoulder because of the low stability but your TMJ is actually easier to dislocate um, than the shoulder joint. Uh, and then again, what can you do with your mandible? You can elevate it, depress it. You can move it side to side, lateral excursion. You can protract it and retract it. And that's so you can you know, properly chew your food. All right, so that is the end of Chapter 8. Uh, joints and movements.